Everybody, thank you so much for another month of your support and welcome to our first Crowdcast 2021. Today, our special guest is Chief Petty Officer, Senior Chief Petty Officer, John Wilson, U.S. Navy retired, um, who has a lot of awesome stories about his life in the Navy, a lot of just interesting, I don't know, life experience. You're a seasoned gentleman and uh, who has pivoted in his civilian career into professional photography. It has a lot of interesting stuff from that. So, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, who are you? Where are you from? Why are you here? Well, I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up on a farm uh, in between Nashville and Murfreesboro. And like Jackson said, I spent 23 years uh, in the U.S. Navy, came in as an E-1, left as a <clears throat> pardon me, senior chief petty officer, which is an E-8, for those of you who know a little bit about the military. Uh, I had a variety of jobs in and out of uh, Navy medicine, uh, sort of fast forward to working in a lot of clinics, uh, worked in the Navy drug rehab world, served on a lot of ships, and during that time I took advantage of the opportunities to get higher education. I got my bachelor's and my master's degree and then sort of tripped backwards into this great job at Denver Health when I came up here to Denver in the training and development vertical and my interest in photography lined up with that and uh, as a photographer and videographer there was always opportunities to use those skills in the training world and uh, slowly but surely I took more of a less of a hobbyist interest and more of a professional interest and I own Thousand Words Photography in uh, beautiful Rhino in the Arts District and uh, hopefully people outside of Colorado don't know what that means well hopefully hopefully this is about the time during the edit Jackson will put my Instagram mm. so uh, anyone who wants to reach out to me can and I've uh, been a instructional designer and professional photographer for about 10 years and what brought you to Colorado originally uh, a large aircraft <laughs> okay <laughs> no uh, it was a girl uh, okay yeah. a girl one of those things. Yeah. I've moved for that kind yeah. of reason myself. Yeah. It was a W.C. Phil said he was once in love with a beautiful blonde that drove him to drink, and it's the only thing he remains uh, indebted to her for. <laughs> but no, I, I love it here. Everybody wants to be the last person to move to Colorado, and I certainly, it's my home now. Yeah. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's see. We actually. Is there, is there any kind of record for the least amount of questions people ask one of your guests? That just that people have a total disinterest in the person next to you because I, I think I'm I've never I, seen that yeah. <laughs> um, okay so we did have a question here that was about Viking navigation let's see if either of us has anything to say about it Dave Eden so by the way folks if you ask questions kind of on the sidebar it's easier for me to see um, but we had, do we know how the Vikings navigated on long sea voyages with the skills using the sun and stars, whatever be recognizable by modern mariners as part of the basic backup skill set for when all electronics fail and your compass goes overboard? So we did have the Blood of Emir podcast with um, the Hurstwich gentleman who talked about how um, naval combat was conducted in the Viking Age. Do you know anything about navigation with uh, pre-modern instruments or without instruments? How would that be done? You know. Well, one of the things that... <clears throat> The opportunities I had when I was on board the USS Kitty Hawk, even as a chief petty officer, we were encouraged to train for bridge watches. So I was actually qualified as a conning officer on the Kitty Hawk, which is an aircraft carrier. Can you describe the Kitty Hawk? Give us some dimensions and such. Kitty Hawk is one, uh, she's since been retired, but at the time she was one of 12 uh, what they call super carriers, about 1,150 feet long, 85,000 ton draft. Uh, complement of about 75 to 80 aircraft, you know, close to 5,000 uh, uh, men and women when uh, embarked. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> and naturally, I was uh, I was on board Kitty Hawk from 2000 to 2003, and so the entire suite of modern navigation was available to her from GPS to the the types of satellite technology that the military would have. But coincidentally, when you go up on the bridge, there are two quartermasters that track every plot and fix with a traditional sextant and stellar navigation hmm. uh, and because redundancy is so important that if your electronic systems went out you want several people on board who know how to do that from the stars so essentially the same thing uh, you know, Magellan used right, in sure. his day yeah. I, I have never fully understood how navigation by stars works I mean I know the North Star has a fixed position 
I think, uh, and I'm, I, if there's a quartermaster in your Patreon, they're going to ding me on this. I think it, I think it's very similar to the way our geopositioning satellites work. And if you have an azimuth and angle toward three things, and you know where those three things are supposed to be, you can fix your position on, and, I, and it also involves very accurate timing. So if I know exactly what time it is, where the North Star is, and Orion's belt, or whichever ones, and these quartermasters we have know a ridiculous uh, number of stars and constellations, depending on the hemisphere you're in. And uh, then they actually play games against the actual ship's GPS and they're ridiculously close <laughs> to the position the GPS gives you off of the three satellites that they get fixes on. And, and I ought to point out that in the sagas, they never really talk about how they navigate beyond something like they recognize particular birds as being characteristic of a particular place or something like that. It's not, William Short disagreed with me about this during the, the naval combat crowdcast. I still think that for, in large part, it's not the sailors who are the saga writers. Right, these are sort of different walks of life, and so you know, the same way that I would get in a plane and talk about being in a plane without telling you anything about how the plane works, I imagine that a lot of these saga writers just don't even necessarily know that much about how uh, navigation is done. So they really don't talk about it in the saga. Didn't the saga writers also rely on like several generations of oral tradition before they finally were literate to write them down? So well, yeah. So so for example, the the voyage, the initial voyage of discovery of Finland or northeastern Canada is like 990, right? And that song is written down in the 1200s. So you've got right. yeah. It's a long several long, generations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we can't we can't always take take them at their word even because of that. Um, okay, I saw something over here. Um, so. I guess this is more for me. Uh, what the Vikings of Byzantium and Constantinople. Um, that is an interesting question, but something probably to deal with in, a, in its own video, right? There's a lot of stuff with that, with the Varangian Guard and, and, and raids down in that part of the world. Um, Nero Stracinger asks, how is daytime navigation done? So like without stars? Well, there's two, there's, traditionally there's two ways to determine the position of a ship uh, on the ocean, and they're called a fix and a plot. And a fix is based on previously fixed things, stars or lighthouses or things on the shore that you can triangulate against. And if you're in a position at sea where you can't fix, you plot your position based on time, speed, and distance from your last fix. So okay. if at noon you shot a fix off a particular lighthouse and that's where you are on the chart and you've been going north northeast at 17 knots for x number of minutes you get an estimation and i think their ethos is to get as many plots as they can until they get in a position to where they can get an actual fix on uh, literally a fixed position okay yeah uh, Aaron K. asks, what advice would you give me that wants to go into the Navy? <clears throat> that's a great question, and I should pay a fine every, every time I tell you that's a great question. So I've had, I've had the opportunity over, over a period of time, I've been retired for a decade, to talk to a lot of young women and men uh, who were thinking about a career in the military. And... Uh, have to be really careful because there are a lot of very hard-working recruiters and are, they're very patriotic and they uh, they have very hard jobs so the first thing you need to understand are recruiters it, it would be tantamount to you and I you if you want your first car and you were to walk into a Toyota dealership and say tell me what kind of car to buy it's almost a guarantee that you're going to be recommended a Toyota so you haven't really done any comparison shopping so just be advised the recruiters are there to fill positions that the Navy has given them in some kind of monthly report. We need this many radar operators this month. We need this many hospital corpsmen this month. So Kind of a quota thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they're very hard working, but they're also very uh, pressured to fill these positions, not unlike the Toyota dealer would be. So the first thing is, is use the power of the Internet and, uh, and 
but the, the, every branch of the military, Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, Coast Guard, Army, has legitimate websites that, that, that you, the taxpayer, supports. Find out the jobs available. Find out someone. Talk to someone who's actually done the job. Do your comparison shopping. And then the piece of advice, so let's say, for example, you decide you want to be a hospital corpsman. <clears throat> Before you go talk to the recruiter, uh, one thing I found out, nothing, people in the Navy and the military in general, our favorite thing to talk about are ourselves. And every major job specialty in the military has an organization dedicated to reunions and sort of getting together and talking about what we used to do. And right. the older we get, the naturally the braver we used to be. So once you sort of lock down a particular career field, go online and see if there's actually a, an organization mm -hmm. of former individuals who did this job. And sure. I helped one young lady who wanted to be a crypto analyst, and I said, well, let's go see if there's a crypto analyst association, and there were several. And within about 20 minutes, I had a chief petty officer swapping emails with her. And that way, when you talk to someone who's done the job, you can sort of find out the true ins and outs that the recruiter the recruiter, the recruiter's not going to lie to you, but they may underemphasize right. certain aspects of the job. Well, that's true of any job. I mean, when I was a kid, um, my grandfather's best advice to me, and I wish I had followed it better, was if you want a job, talk to the people who have that job. Right. And, right. you know, I, I thought I did that, and I didn't really do it as well as I could sure. have. Yeah. Right. But now, I mean, the Internet, you can, can you tell us how to use the Internet? Is there uh, <clears throat> no. Okay. No. Yeah. It's... it's uh, has something to do with pixie dust and unicorn tears. Right. I, re I really don't know. But but no, that's an excellent example too about like you go into a Toyota dealership and sure. you say I need a new car and they're going to say you need a Toyota. <laughs> right. I mean, I see this all the time at Trigger Time Gun Club in Longmont, Colorado. I've heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> yeah. Five dollars every time I say that. Yeah. Um. I also saw a quick question uh, for me about the 2020 retrospective video. So I did a 2017, 2018, 2019 video. Uh, and I didn't do a 2020 retrospective video because I thought nobody liked them. <laughs> maybe certainly I'll, no one liked 2020. Yeah. Um, maybe I will. Uh, maybe I will count the first week of 2021 as 2020 and cool. and, and do the retrospective. Uh, we'll see. Um, let's see, Trine asks, my twin is an aerographer's mate up in Norfolk. Any experience with that? <clears throat> Yes, uh, and congratulations to so aerographers mates. Uh, I don't know how they came to use that name. Uh, <clears throat> our sometimes not kind uh, nickname for aerographers mates are weather guessers, and they're uh, they're actually a very hardworking group of people within the Navy for whom meteorology weather is their stock and trade. And as you can imagine, ships at sea, uh, naval installations, you know, we tend to like to put our naval installations next to big bodies of water that have big bodies of weather and typhoons and hurricanes. So uh, I don't know how many aerographers mates. I know they actually get underway on the ship. Uh, and uh, I forgot which captain told me, it says, what do, what do little boys and girls who lie grow up to be? And he said, weather guessers. And, uh, but now they're, they're, they're really valuable members of the crew. And uh, as you can imagine, you have a national asset worth billions of dollars with more billions of dollars worth of planes and equipment and things that go boom on board and you don't want to inadvertently drive one into a, into a typhoon. Right. That oh, makes sense. Aerographer is kind of a cool word. Air, it is kind of a cool word. Air drawer, I guess, Air, basically. Aerographers, mate. They're the weather techs. So... <laughs> Auburn asks, uh, smoking cigars versus smoking pipes versus smoking hookah, any thoughts? I tried smoking a pipe the other day. Yeah. Carl's over here smoking a pipe right now. Do you have yeah. any thoughts for us, Carl? Yeah. He's I shaking think, his head. I think, the, I think the pipe tends to add a couple of SAT points. Yeah, that may be uh, true. And so there's, if you go to TV tropes, there's a trope called good smoking, evil smoking. And <laughs> <laughs> and pipes are like the definitive of good smoking. <laughs> Cigars are kind of down a notch and tend to be like Schwarzenegger type characters. It's, right. it's, gen it's generally someone who's represented as being too wealthy by half or Either has too, some kind of evil. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or you know. or it can be a manly thing. Can like be a Schwarzenegger a little, kind yeah, of character. Yeah. And then cigarettes tend to be like the evil smoking. Yeah. 
yeah. especially those long cigarette holder things. Yeah. And I've never smoked a hookah. Unless you're Cruella de Vil, and it adds to the... But our friend Carl is adding no SAT points because he's essentially dressed like the brawny paper towel guy with a pipe in his mouth, and it's just not its not doing much for him. <laughs> uh, Richard says, not Navy, Marine vet myself, eight years Hoorah. of some change. So a, a jelly yut to you guys. I used to do essentially AM things, but only FA-18 specific for the core, MOS 6257. Sure. I still do in Kuwait as a contractor where I'm watching from. Anyways, speaking of Madhu Slogan's war cries and such official and unofficial, have you guys come across examples of such in the sagas or historical research? Ooh. War cries like Ura and Yeah, I mean, one that you see in a few sagas is a variation of "Now I give you to Odin, Nu Gevek Ither Othni," which uh, there's two of the king sagas where someone throws a spear over an opposing army and says that um i cannot off the top of my head think about other like u.s military style like sort of core yeah. specific uh war cries as such but that's an interesting question um so i don't know hoorah though hoorah marine um Marcel, I'm still confused about possible uses of sunstones mentioned above. The way I understand it, they can best be used to find the position of the sun when the sun itself is hidden behind clouds below the horizon, but you can still find a blue patch of sky. That doesn't sound like a great advantage, but maybe I'm wrong. Do you know anything about sunstones? I don't know anything about sunstones. I know that, <clears throat> uh, put on my Norse expert hat, I know when the History Channel's Vikings were first establishing Ragnar Lothbrok as a character, supposedly he had some stone in which he could fix his, literally fix his position, uh, which allowed him to sail over to Northumberland mm. and start their war and you know, raids, but I have no idea. Yeah, and there's one artifact that was found in Greenland that people have wondered if it was some kind of navigational tool. I, I think it's a piece of a disc that had 32 lines in it or something like that. Mm. Uh, whether that is a, quote, sun zone or not, it's hard to say. Again, remember, the sagas really don't talk about how this stuff was done. Um, and see, Megan asks, after being in the Navy, was there value add to getting a BA afterwards? I've always wondered if service should be the equivalent of a BA when you get out. <clears throat> That's a, cha ching, another excellent question. Um, I, I per, and you know, your mileage may vary. I, I believe that there's such a breadth of great jobs and things you can learn and, and management and leadership experience that uh, any university that wanted to attract a good group of women and men would give certain credit for military experience. Uh, I was really fortunate to have had some circumstances uh, in my career where uh, I was able to avail myself of some on, on base uh, education and the military. And one thing that I can really say as a sort of a walking recruiting poster is the military bends over backwards to provide good educational experiences for its women and men. Uh, it, you know, it only took me you know, just a short 12 years to cobble together a bachelor's degree. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then after that, and, and you know, when, I, when I realized that I probably wasn't going to be doing the things I was doing in the military on the outside world, which is a mistake I see people make. There are not a lot of opportunities out here for torpedo repair. And, and that is a complete career field in the military. So it, I just use tuition assistance and I'm so happy to get my master's degree. Uh, but yeah, I agree that the, you know, the management experience, you know, we've got two chief petty officers sitting here and uh, you know, the cats you have to herd and the things you have to do under more than a little bit of pressure should certainly count for you know, some you know, basic, uh, oh, not humanities credit, well, and you did you did a lot of work in drug rehab. I did. I, mean, I did. Yeah, that was my. So after after starting out in the medical field, which I got to know a lot of good Marines over in Pendleton, because of my personal circumstances, and I don't mind knowing, I I, I found sobriety uh, on active duty. Already being in the medical field, the military has this wonderfully uh, well established and well researched and well funded uh, drug and alcohol rehab. Uh, infrastructure and it makes sense you know you spend 
you know, maybe upwards of a million dollars training in a particular, and when, and you can get it in the multiple millions of dollars if you have a pilot or a Navy SEAL or somebody. Right. So it's more important than just having a simple EAP at your local, um, you know, white collar job to try to save these people. And plus, <clears throat> you know, the type of people that we have on active duty in, in stressful situations and far away from home for months and months and months at a time, I think our statistics for alcohol abuse probably a little bit higher than the national average. So it makes sure. sense to have yeah. professionals that can offer help and referrals. So yeah, I probably spent probably close to my last 10 years working directly in the drug and alcohol rehab field. Did you ever consider doing that in the civilian world? I did, I did. And uh, it was just one of those happy accidents that uh, when I finished my bachelor's degree, I just knew I wanted a master's and I knew that would be to my benefit. And the master's I happened to get shifted me more into training and development than it did into drug and alcohol rehab. Hmm. And, and another happy accident is Denver Health you know, needed to put together a training team and, and having some clinical background, it just made sense. How did you get into photography? I'm gonna ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a camera in my hand since I was a child. Uh, my younger brother is a guitar player and you know, both he and I had some artistic bent, even kind of coming out of you know, redneck part of Tennessee. And I always loved film and loved being behind a lens. And when I got into the training world, it was always to my advantage to be able to take videos and uh, instead of getting a stock photo of Dr. You know, Smith uh, off the interweb, we just go down to the ED and, and suddenly it became, well, who's taking these photographs? And, and, I am, you know, and I, I'm just fascinated with the equipment and the technology and post-processing and Photoshop and, uh, and have been able to make uh, not a great living. I still work as a trainer and instructional designer, but I, you know, I've been able to pay for a pretty expensive habit as a photographer. Are you team Canon or Nikon? Oh, there comes the tribalism. I'm team Canon, and I don't think anything's less important. 20 people sign off. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> bye. No, I shoot, uh, I, sh I have a, uh, <clears throat> as a professional, you can't have one of anything. And I shoot with, uh, right now, a Canon EOS R, which is their new mirrorless. I have it. I just happen to have, have it here with all the extra battery grip and best lens, a Sigma 85 millimeter art lens. And uh, I also have a Canon ADD that I use for video and backup. And <clears throat> if everyone in the Denver area watching this signs up to get me to do headshots, I'll be able to afford the new Canon R5. Well, you That's know, I've got a book coming out in September and I got the go. great courses thing. Maybe we need to get you to take my next author photo. I, I think that's doable. I think that's doable. We'll, and take, and we'll take suggestions about what this should look like. Yeah. Hat, no hat, background. Ooh. Yeah, there's a lot of questions yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, there's been a lot of chatter. But I'm, te I'm team camp. I'm missing, I'm missing stuff, yeah. I'm sure. Well, I, I, <clears throat> I, I feel obligated to say that <clears throat> it's... In 2021, it's really hard to find a bad automobile. I mean, you really have to work. Uh, and it's really hard. <laughs> I found <it's>, some. <laughs> it, but it's also hard to find a bad camera. Mm -hmm. If you stick with you know, Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fuji, uh, it's more important if you're thinking, and I just swapped some texts with a beginning photographer earlier today, it's more important as to which camera within there, you know, don't just let the Toyota guy point you to the right, $50,000 right, right. truck if that's not what you need. Right. But... Uh, they all, they all tend to work really well. So I just, you know, I use my phone for everything, including all the videos that I make. People yeah, ask me really sometimes, good. like as recently as this week, people have asked me on Patreon, like, what do you use to make your videos? My phone. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So I mean, even these are amazing now. They are. They are. And I, you know, I, <clears throat> I've had a lot of people ask me what I thought about the improving technology of iPhones, and I'm all for it. It, it. it generates more interest in photography in general, brings more people into the field, and it's not a, it's not a zero-sum thing. The more people, the more the merrier. I'm not in competition with the person in Boulder that's shooting right. weddings. Right, right. And it also floods the world with really bad photographs. <laughs> and and it, the more people on Instagram that take a selfie and throw some dumb filter on it, and then somebody sees something that's professionally shot, it sort of stands in relief that there is actually something 
to somebody who knows how to take a, a decent right. photograph. No, I think it's true. Yeah. I think in a sense, yeah, you're right. The more the internet is kind of flooded with amateur stuff, the more yeah. the professional stuff really does kind of yeah. stand out. You're yeah. right, that's, that's, that's well put. And the suggestion that I've seen so far was me looking into the sunset with the hat over my heart. Mm. Do you have an opinion on the old Canon AE-1? Yes, that was, my, that was my first uh, single lens reflex camera. I bought it at uh, Marine Corps Exchange in Pendleton. And, and Canon has made really good equipment. Uh, I don't know how long the AE system was around. Uh, mine was film, and I think the AE-1 and it sounds like someone is more familiar with it than I was. It was just my first film DSLR, or SLR, it wasn't a DSLR. And it was great, and they were sort of the Chevy and Pal of the time. Everybody who had, everybody who had a, a, a modern camera tended to have a Canon AE-1. Yeah. Well, we've got, all right, we've got Navy questions, we've got Viking ship questions, we've got camera questions coming in. Um, so we're gonna get a grab bag here. Also, if you, if you use the side, it's easier for me to keep track of questions than the ask a question function. Um, given the harsh climate of Iceland, how many months out of the year were Vikings able to travel between Iceland and Norway, Denmark? They certainly emphasize sailing during the summer, and it's a plot point in some sagas uh, that they don't want to sail too late in the year. Uh, Bjorn Saga makes a plot point of that. That's the one I just posted like last week that I filmed back in November. Um, where Bjorn can't get to Iceland to marry the girl because he's he's going to leave too late. So definitely the the summer is the pref preferential time. Um, let's see. Auburn asks: Does a ship the size of the Kitty Hawk move with wave movement, or is it so large as to be fairly stable most of the time? <clears throat> Cha-ching! Another great question. <coughs> Carriers are generally larger than the weather that they go through. Generally. Hmm. But you can always find some place on planet Earth that where the weather is bigger than you are. And once again, our orographer's mate helps us a lot avoid uh, sea states that could be damaging to the ship. Uh, carriers have flat bottoms. A lot of people don't know that. They don't have the, the, the knife-like bottom. <laughs> and they do, tend to, they do tend to move around a little bit. Uh, but I've... I've stood up on the flight deck of carriers that were just as solid as this table and you watch the destroyer get its submarine pay every 30 seconds that's uh, <laughs> going through the troughs of the waves. They're generally really stable. There's a need for that. You have an airport on the roof, which right. is kind of nice to have those stable. But there are some great YouTube videos of what some of the pilots have to go through because they're, they're trying to land on an airfield that's moving away from them at 17 knots and is also mm. canned off to the side. Uh, and anyone who tells you they don't get seasick uh, just hasn't spent a lot of time at sea. <laughs> you have a, se a secret about seasickness? Just uh, look at the horizon. Try to get a, try to get out in the uh, in the weather and, and look out at the horizon. But when the ship starts to roll on all sh starts to move on all three axes, pitch rolling y'all, <clears throat> it will eventually do something to your inner ear that's going to get you started to you know feel bad about the about the omelet you had. Well, I've barely been to the ocean. I mean, I've been on a sh uh, fishing boat, yeah. right? I mean, that's like my entire experience with being yeah. out in the ocean. I, uh, I guess it's more than Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. No, Mr. No Sea Time. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Richard Bledsoe asks, have either of you been in connection with the skipper crew volunteers of the Drakken Harald Horfager and their experience of sailing a longship around Europe, their Atlantic crossings, the Great Lakes? No, I have not. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of connections with the archaeology or the sort of living archaeology, recreation yeah. people. Okay, I'm going to go back over here and see if I can catch the questions we might have missed over here. Do we know of any cigar or smoke shops in Colorado that have doka? What is doka? No idea. I don't know what that is, so apparently not. Um, but I'm not very cool. Uh, I know I s Okay, Dave Eden, I did my degree in geology and a classmate was a nine-year vet and submariner from the Canadian Navy. Cool. We had these vector problems in first-year physics that some of us found hard, but they were easy for him from Navy training, e.g. how to guide a helicopter to land or ship and win with. Of course, yeah, that yeah. kind of practical sure. experience. Yeah. Um, let's see. 
Marcel asks, I'm also wondering about Viking ships and dragons. They're known as dragon ships, right? Now, why are ships dragons? So you could kill a dragon, fall from Europe, but he was more like a snake. Ships are not similar to snakes, except to them they are. Uh, very often in, in Norse poetic kinnings, uh, ships are called snakes. Um, in fact, uh, you know, you, you notice that one of the really famous ones is um, Oliver Trickson's uh, Longi Ormer, the Long Serpent. Um, they really did think of them as, as snake-like. And I mean, I think if you watch ships at sea, there is a sort of slithery motion you can kind of make out with the waves hitting the ship. And, and weren't <clears throat> part of the ethos of the Vikings to have something on the prow of the ship to elicit fear? And, that too, and, and that's and often a dragon. And so that can be kind of used like you would talk, what, what is it called? Is that metonymy? Where, you, where like you call the government the White House? So you call the ship the dragon because it's got the dragon on it. Mm. Although interestingly, in the old heathen laws, which I read in a video from about a year and a half ago, one of the laws specifies you're supposed to take that ship, the dragon, off of the ship before you sail into land because otherwise it might scare the spirits of the land. Mm. It's kind of a neat little thing. Um, okay, so then I... Th Oh, what photography software do you enjoy using, Melissa oh, asks? in my wheelhouse. If I had <laughs> any advice to give for anyone that just wanted to take their photography to the next level, it's, it's really a two-step process. You know, photography today is essentially data collection. You know, <clears throat> every time I snap with my Canon, 30 million data points wind up on the sensor. And if you have some moderate photography skills and you understand a little bit about light and how your camera works and how to you know get the thing off of manual uh, you're going to get some good data but the second part of photography is post-processing and you know I hope once again as Jackson puts my I'll put, I'll put some puts my website a plus pictures up here yeah, <laughs> that uh, the short answer to the question is I use Photoshop and as a professional, I have Adobe's uh, Creative Cloud. It's like $22 a month. And um, for an amateur or hobbyist photographer, that that's might, might not make sense. But there's some really good free uh, software packages that mimic Adobe, sort of the way OpenOffice mimics mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft Word. It essentially does everything Adobe does. You just have to work a little harder. Like what, uh, what do you do? There's one that's called GIMP. Which makes me laugh because I think about Pulp Fiction when I uh, when I talk about it, and uh, it's a really good. It, it 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 is as capable as the parts of Adobe Photoshop you would likely use hmm. to process, especially portraiture. There are certain things you want the eyes to come out, and and you know it's not these crazy things where you make the biceps ten times bigger like you can, see on. Can you do that on my my author photo thing? Possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I would I would say certainly Photoshop. There's some really super high end like Capture One. That's some of the Hasselblad shooters, um, and I've no experience with that. I've been using Photoshop for about ten years. And, but yeah, try check out GIMP. And another thing, if you really want to take your photography to the next level, after you spend a few hours learning your way around your camera, <clears throat> whatever it's like whatever team you're going to be a fan of, if it's Team Photoshop or Team GIMP. There's ridiculous amounts of really good YouTube videos of people who just can't wait, and they're just very giving people. Sometimes they're trying to sell a couple things at the end, but uh, you can, uh, on a long weekend, instead of rabbit holing Game of Thrones, eight or ten hours, you can really pick up the necessary skills you need to work with post processing. I've heard of people learning things on YouTube. That's a that's a novel concept to me, though. But no, you're right. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's amazing all the stuff that's out there to teach yeah, you how to use just yeah. about anything. Yeah, I teach use you Adobe how to fix Premier a car. for videos. Yeah. All that Adobe Suite stuff is really great. Sure. But they, yeah, Adobe's they're sort of like IBM was in the '70s with digital computers. They they sort of own the high ground. Oh. Yeah, but that that subscription model, man, that is. Whew, that yeah, can the Adobe Cult. It's like the cult. I'm, I'm cult of Canon, cult of Adobe. Hey, I'm trying to figure out what the next question in order was. There's, there's enough of them that I'm confused because I'm an old man. Okay, I think this is where I left off. Um, Monsi asks, ever tried old school camera setups with plates and chemicals and stuff? <clears throat> no, I uh, <clears throat> had the opportunity to go to a uh, a seminar 
and one of the guys shooting had a literal full uh, full size 8x10 uh, Ansel Adams type rig and it just uh, just looked really complicated uh, and my actual only experience with uh, film processing goes back to being around uh, radiographs and x-rays when I was doing something completely different and uh, no, I, uh, I started out with my Canon AE-1 back in the day where you take 36 exposures, hope you got 10 of them right, take them to CVS or wherever and cross your fingers. Right. And, yeah. I was using a uh, film camera until 2013. That's awesome. Because I'm there, that much of an old man. There are a lot of, just like audio files, and once again, you can get into cult warfare. Oh, yeah, you sure. know, Vinyl versus digital. There are some devotees that will swear that you can do things with film stock and everything. As a as a professional, you know I can shoot. You know, digital real estate's free, and you know once you have your lights set up, you can. Uh, I said if you don't take particularly good photographs, just take a lot of them, and you're going to find something. And uh, Photoshop comes with this sorting tool called Lightroom, where you can kind of throw away your your missed shots and. Mm. So it, it, it's like cheating, but it's good cheating. No, absolutely. I mean, that kind of shotgunning. Yeah. 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 Uh, John Phillips asks, any first-hand experience with the Kraken or Havguva or any cool Navy superstitions? Oh, Lord. The Navy is, runs on superstition the way it runs on fuel. Uh, I never personally saw a Kraken. Um, so you see Kraken tattoos. They seem to show up a lot. You know, I've got a lot of art thanks to the military. Um trying to think is I I mean I, I, I joined in 84 and I think most of the people kind of winked and nodded at true superstitions I never met anyone who uh, actually believed them but the mythology of, of you know never whistle on board a warship <laughs> because people confuse it for the bosun whistle and you know and some of the some of the ritual you know, I've crossed the equator and I, I got to go through that uh, that little Is that where you shave your head? You do a lot of things when you cross the equator. Uh, probably some of the things back then that we wouldn't discuss on your podcast. Uh, but yeah, the, the you know, storytelling, uh, you know, play a lot of backgammon, but I'm trying to think of Kraken. I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm kind of going blank on that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but no Kraken experience. None, not, not, none that I'm, I, the non-disclosure agreement I signed still is in effect on that. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Right. The Area 51 of Crockett. Right, right. Uh, Nira asks, what are some food or drink hazards at sea beyond rickets and scurvy? I've heard a crew could be poisoned with just three drops of machine oil in the water supply. Well, I know, <clears throat> so that's a that's a complicated question. So in the days of in the days of sail and some of the lore and history we have to study, uh, scurvy was a huge problem, and, uh, and this was in certainly pr- almost pre-scientific days, and of course no one knew what vitamins were, so no one knew what vitamin C was, and actually no one knew what a lack of vitamin C would do. And uh, on these long sailing ships, the lack of vitamin C would lead to scurvy, and from what I understand, it was a horrible way to go. And somehow the British figured out that, uh, probably by mistake, that eating citrus uh, tended to prevent scurvy in the crew and some of the citrus that they were because of the part of the world they were working in were limes right. which are why British sailors are called I, I think it, it's not a term of endearment it's why they call them limeys it was actually that was a term of endearment because they'd figured out by eating limes that uh, it was a way to prevent scurvy uh, fresh water uh, is probably the most precious asset uh, a warship has next to its ordnance uh, the big carriers we have six um, desail four steam desalinators which are essentially uh, stills they bring in seawater and through the interaction with the steam create some fresh water and in the hundreds of thousands of gallons because whether you're a nuclear carrier or a diesel carrier you still create steam to turn the machinery that turns the propellers of the ship the props and uh, the, the the crew is actually a little more tolerant of maybe impure water than the boilers are the number one priority for water uh, is is the viability of the boilers 
Uh, number two is food for the crew. Number three is corrosion control for the aircraft. And it's not until number four that showers. So <laughs> if you ever, uh, very rare occasions where you're running low on water, they'll secure showers before, but they will wash the planes before they wash you. <laughs> uh, let me see what's here and ask a question. Auburn asks, any favorite subjects for your photos? I, uh, I'm a portrait shooter. I like to shoot people. Uh, I, uh, that's I'm going to isolate that quote. I like to shoot people. That's right. That'll be, yeah, there goes my, sen <laughs> there goes my senatorial run. Now, everyone that gets into photography, it's such a great hobby and it's a decent profession, whether, uh, whether you shoot landscapes or uh, I know people that make decent money shooting real estate because of coming from the corporate world and doing videos of people talking to cameras and learning how to light and a thing or two about lenses, I, I much prefer portraiture. Uh, you know, my last couple of gigs were uh, not the most creative things, headshots for uh, a group of financiers in the cannabis industry. And I got a call back and shot one of the CEOs, made a magazine cover which Jackson will be showing now. Yeah, that was my first magazine cover. So yeah, I love to shoot people. And I've been in that rabbit hole long enough that as a professional, a professional photographer not only brings his or her skills, but his or her workflow. If I can get a good photograph of you, but it's gonna take me 20 hours, that's just not gonna be an economically viable thing. So when you get good at what you do, you also get a really good workflow so you can create something in Photoshop really quickly mm -hmm. uh, after the fact and deliver it. I've done a lot of senior uh, photographs. Those have been fun. Uh, I've done some boudoir work, which has been it. That's what most of my friends tend to pick up on my website and ask me about. Somehow that word never stops being funny to me. Boudoir. It's like moist. <laughs> Lugubrious. Uh, Marcel and Claris were asking about Viking Age superstitions about what to not do on a ship. Um, I have seen, in just just sort of gauging from sagas, there seems to be something about cats. Well, not having cats on a ship. Um, I can't remember where... Vikings seem like dog people. I mean. They do seem like dog yeah. people. They definitely were dog people. Norwegian elk hounds specifically. Um, and... I want to say once I saw something. Now I'm, I'm trying to recall stuff from sagas. Something about not mentioning the names of women on ships. Hmm. I'm trying to remember where I saw that, but there was some saga where that came up, and I wondered if that was some kind of weird ship taboo. Hmm. But there often are weird ship yeah. taboos, and in cultures all across yeah. the world. Yeah, I, I, well, I remembered one. After, uh, so supposedly every ship during its commissioning yeah. has a silver dollar that's given to the captain that's placed some in some secret place in the carrier, supposed to be, it's when the carrier's being built, it's when the island, huh. and, and I think that goes all the way back to paying your toll over the river sticks if you're huh. sent, to, sent to the bottom. So it's like the toll for the ship, if the ship's Right, yeah, oh, that's you have a silver cool. dollar. Huh, that's a new one, actually. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Marcel, would they have scurvy problems in Iceland because of the types of available food stuff? I would think so. I don't know if hmm. leeks and onions have vitamin C. Onions do. Yeah, they yeah. must. So I think that would probably yeah. be what they'd eat. And they ate a lot of onions, so yeah. that might have staved off some of those problems. Um, Trinae says, I took a photography class in high school. I liked the dark room. Do you develop your pictures like that? I don't know how it works professionally. What was the question again? Do you use a dark room or develop your pictures like that? How do you... No, you don't have to I'll, do that, right? No, everything, everything I've shot for the last decade and a half has been digital. So, uh, no. Okay, I'm seeing people who are resisting my comment about cats. I don't know. Again, I, I'm, I'm trying to recall something I saw in Sagas once. Um, Melissa asked what your website is. It's thousand-words.squarespace.com, right? The, so uh, thank you, someone, for finally asking. The easiest way to get to me and my business and then link to my website is, uh, and, and most of the people I talk to and arrange uh, contract work for is through Instagram. And my Instagram is photo, P-H-O-T-O, dot smooth. 
S-M-O-O-T-H. And please feel free to ding me on that. I've gone through about 500 possible Instagram handles before that one was finally available. So it's P-H-O-T-O dot smooth. And weapons free to ding me on that. I, I deserve every, every, everything you can say. I don't think it's that bad. I know. I think it's terrible. But once yeah. you once you have your handle and you get a few hundred followers, then you know you can't you can't change it. So and, I'm happy with it. And by the way, so so Richard says, well, I'm not saying that I'm wrong about the cat thing, but it's you know maybe I am. I've been wrong about things in the past. There was a whole video I deleted probably long before any of y'all saw my channel. Um, my original video about Vinland and exploration of Canada. Uh, I was looking at salmon and I said the reverse of the truth. I said something about how there weren't salmon as far south as Newfoundland or something when Newfoundland is overcome with salmon. And so many fishermen complained at me that I had to delete the video. And I don't even remember I got that. But I'm not a fish expert. I'm not a ship expert. This will be my first opportunity to get excoriated on the internet. So Your first... Yeah, I've never oh, yes. never done this, so whatever mistakes I'm making, feel free to lambast me. Well, Stella's pretty great about managing the actual YouTube page Good. that way, so um, maybe you can get some screenshots of the excoriation. Hopefully two or three people are going to my Instagram right now. And roasting you? I Feel free. Yeah. That's my... So the one, the one, the be, one of the best pieces of advice one of my photo heroes ever gave me was the difference between a good photographer and a great one is a great photographer never lets any of his or her bad shots be seen so you really you know my Instagram is pretty well curated sure um let's see Clarice asked about funeral rituals for Vikings lost at sea I don't know we do see um ocean funerals at times uh, for example uh, Halfred the Saga Vondra the Skalds I don't think I've done a video on that whole saga but I've done some videos on Halfred's poetry but Halfred dies at the end of his saga aboard ship and he is put into a coffin and dropped into the ocean so I mean not too different perhaps from burial at sea today as far as lost at sea um, we do see rune stones that um, are erected for people lost at sea. In fact, the, there's a stock phrase for it, which is quite simply, Do we have died in the ocean. Mm. Um, and as a weird connection to that, in Frozen, if you look at the gravestones of the girl's parents, spoiler alert, in the first two minutes of the movie, their parents die. Um, I was going to watch that. I wrote in runes in Viking Age Younger Futhark their names and then Do we have on those gravestones. Little things that uh, uh, I don't think I've even ever mentioned that in my Frozen video. Um, okay, Melissa says she needs a headshot and will be in touch. <laughs> Special discount for all Jackson Crawford fans. And yeah, Stella says, respectfully, I don't need fuel on any fires. Well, I hope not to, uh, to, to put too many fuel on those YouTube fires. Um, Dave Eden asked, did Vikings hunt whales? Uh, I don't know about hunt them, certainly harvested them on shore. Yeah. Hunting whales is a pretty difficult proposition, I understand. Um, I know the, the whaling industry with the long boats and the specialized whaling vessels is pretty complicated. Yeah, that 19th century Moby Dick stuff. That's... Yeah. Which is based on a true story. Moby Dick? Mm-hmm. Huh. I like Moby Dick. I'm not, yeah. <gasps> I've never heard it was based yeah. on a true story. Before. Yeah, Herman Melville was, uh, my understanding was... Uh, Bosun made her a whaler, but heard that as an oral story of a ship that was actually you know, rammed by a, a large whale and the, the survival story. I don't think there were any Ishmaels involved in it, but yeah. You know, um, things you learn. I read a book from the 19th century from about that period called um, Two Years Before the Mast or Behind the Mast or something like that. You told me about that. Yeah. yeah. I had to read that because when I was in um, Berkeley, teaching at Berkeley, um, I was making so little money that I went looking for another job and the job that I got hired to do was historical reenactor at one of those those parks where you act like you're the crew of an old pirate ship or whaling ship pay, or something. I would pay money that mattered to see. If I could that. <laughs> it didn't last very long. <laughs> and, and it Literally was, pay grown-up money to see that. And it was my deep discomfort with that job that led me to say I need to make money 
with skills I already have and led me to create the YouTube yeah. channel yeah. <laughs> and the Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's a, a weird little connection. Uh, okay, I don't see further questions to us. There's a lot of crosstalk. All right, are there questions we didn't get to or uh, other questions about just about anything else? Anything you want to say? I'm good. I'm good. I appreciate everybody being kind and, and sort of balancing your questions between Navy and photography. Navy is what I did then. Photography is what I do now. I have a great audience. You do. You do. I, I, I'm still stunned that you say so many terrible things about them when they're not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not true. Y'all want to meet Carl, too? Carl, come say hi to the folks. <coughs> Here, take this little thing and talk into it. Not too close. Not too close. Hey, so, folks. Uh, I saw we had a Marine on board here. Uh, thanks for serving over there. I know it's tough. Been out there several times. Um, stay safe out there, and uh, we'll look forward to you uh, coming home safely. Absolutely. Carl is another Navy gentleman, Chief Petty Officer, retired, who was actually my uh, student at uh, the University of Colorado. That's how we met. Oh, we're fine. Yeah, yeah push it toward you. They don't need to see me. Yeah, basically, I uh, <clears throat> retired back in 2013 and decided to use my GI Bill, like John here, and decided to get a bachelor's degree. And, and, and Jackson here was uh, one of my last professors. And after the classes were over, we decided to get together and smoke some cigars and talk shop. So here we are. Funny how those things happen. I see another question coming on down here. Oh, great. People say hi. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, this one's, I guess, more toward me. After getting a degree in Scandinavian studies, what would be the rest career pass? I believe teaching in archaeology would be options, but anything else? I don't know how many options there really are. I mean, I struggle to make it. I have struggled to make it, <laughs> right? I mean, as recently as this year and I'm talking 2021 I have you know tried to figure out how I'm gonna keep paying my bills all my life right <laughs> you know oh uh, those jobs just really aren't out there even in in teaching the jobs are all adjunct jobs they don't last very long um and one experience that I've had and this is kind of like what you were saying about how you know you really need to talk to people who have had these jobs absolutely the mistake I made when I was a high school student was I talked to tenured professors and I assumed that anybody teaching at a university was a tenured professor but that's a very small minority I didn't talk to the people who actually do all the teaching and, and realize they're basically itinerants right you know I moved from university to university teaching and, and those are all one-year contracts right a year I had three one-year contracts at UCLA then I was a janitor in Wyoming for a year then I had two one-year contracts at Berkeley then I had three one-year contracts at University of Colorado before I said you know what yeah. I'm going to try to make this work with Patreon and books and, and the great courses and movie consulting and I mean and that's it's a lot of work so I would say you know it's maybe the best advice I could give in that kind of situation is you know consider are there things you could do that nobody else is doing not that what I'm doing is what nobody else is doing but the world is, is kind of saturated with people with this kind of degree, all fighting for the same jobs. Is there a sidestep you can do, like what I'm trying to do? Um, and good luck with doing that if you're in that position. Um, let's see. Other questions? Oh, okay, we've got a couple others here. Uh, Nero is asking uh, Ron's daughters personifications of death and mishap at sea or lesser gods I would say in the Norse poems where you see Ron's daughters mentioned they are more like personifications of the waves than personalities or um, or real god or giant type figures um, they aren't really characters anywhere um, animal breeding in Viking times we actually don't know much about sheep cattle, horse breeds, that kind of thing. Those things actually change a lot over time. One thing we do kind of know about is um, dogs. 
um, uh, the the breed of dogs is basically the Norwegian elk hound. Okay, so those those are a few kind of tail end questions for me. We've been going for about an hour. Uh, I think we can wind it down. How do you force, feel? Force for me. Final statements. Okay. I didn't, I didn't prepare any statements. So. I never have prepared statements. Just just um, thank everybody, and, and I think you were very kind, and uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, well, it's been great talking to you all. Thank you, John. And uh, for now, from beautiful Colorado, we'll just wish everybody all the best. Cheers.